future world that we are so close to creating will never be. This is the old Elliot, a coward who can't face the truth. You're asking the impossible. You leave us alone forever. <laughs> the universe got big plans for us, bro. I want you to accept the hard truth right here, right now. <laughs> This is F Society IRC Podcast, a Mr. Robot show. I'm your moderator of this chat, Arosha Shai. We are now on episode review six, Brave Traveler. This episode was wow, is the best way to put it. Um, the ending of each of these episodes, I would say for the last four episodes, have just been... Um, quite nail biters really and this one just up the level to the next level like almost boss level if you will say to use a gamer term um up to this point um if you like pay attention to like the articles or the boards you discuss it with people about mr robot there has been a bit of concern about whether or not there is going to be some actual consequences because the nature of television has really changed uh, some consider it to be um the sopranos uh, really starting the uh, kickoff of a more uh, different take on storytelling. Others have noted like Lost where um, main characters have actually died or The Walking Dead, the recent phenomenon of The Walking Dead where nobody knows who who's going to live, who's going to die. Things are challenging. So the expectation of having, you know, consequences of having like a, a reality shake within the world to have some kind of a reality normative where there is consequences and it ripples throughout the season is an expectation. And with the failure of the Steel Mountain plan and the fact that the Dark Army backed out on the deal, there we haven't really seen some like hard hitting consequences on the part of Elliot. I mean, their plan failed, but it doesn't mean that their mission is over. Like they're going to still going to attack evil corp. It's merely just a setback. But with what happened in this episode, you, you see actual real world consequences through the actions and inactions of that. Uh, Elliot has done. And it really goes back to the whole nature of not only Elliot as a person, but the nature of, what he perceives or believes himself to be for this world. I mean, he perceives himself to be a superhero that he's here to kind of wake or fix uh, the world around him. And he sort of does that with his hacking and the manipulation of the people around him. But that's, that's just not how the world works. And it's a very um, unique, not a unique delusion, but a, an interesting delusion that he has. And as, since we're seeing everything through Elliot's eyes, we, kind of rally around that delusion and now that delusion has obviously been shattered with this episode so let's get in it uh, we're going to talk about the episode here going see my scene and then we're going to discuss um what is real because there was a lot that happened in, in this episode there was a lot more hacking this time around uh than the last i would say three episodes i mean yes uh steel mountain there was some hacking going on in there but this is more um there was a lot more movement in that space so let's get into it. So the show opens up with Elliot, you know, talking to the audience again about his fears and what he is as a person. And and he's sitting across from Shayla and they're having a conversation. And at first you think, you know, maybe things are okay, but they're not. It's a very tense and, and weird, strange conversation, which is not unusual because, you, again, you're, you're dealing with Elliot, who's very socially awkward. Uh, but it's slowly becomes apparent that they're they're still in a very bad situation and Elliot is trying to apologize to Shayla for getting her in this mess and that he can he's going to get her out of it but basically once again he's going to be the superhero and save her um so they talk and then they get interrupted and um two gentlemen come in or I should say they were sitting across them in the table because they're in this restaurant and they they one of them we know to be um scumbag's brother uh, seizes Shayla, takes her outside into a car and put, it looks like puts her in a trunk while the other guy takes Elliot to the back of the restaurant and uh, to the phone where he's going to talk to scumbag drug dealer Vera and Vera wants Elliot to break him out of prison and Elliot was like um, 
is impossible. He can't do it. And Vera says that there's a target on his back. He needs to get out tonight. It needs to happen. Uh, basically, if he doesn't, he, he makes it very clear that he's going to kill Shayla and, and no doubt have Elliot killed as well. So Elliot has to figure out how he's going to hack into the prison that, or jail cell detention area that uh, Vera's being held at within 24 hours without any previous recon exploits, known exploits, or things of that nature, f- figuring it out, or otherwise Shayla and he are, are going to very much going to be dead. After the conversation with Vera, uh, Elliot goes with the uh, the two thugs, uh, Isaac's brother, I mean Vera's brother, whose name is Isaac, and the other the other guy, and they go back to his apartment so he could begin his work on hacking into the jail cell to let uh, Vera out. Uh, it's interesting here is because once again, Elliot can't help himself and he, he's bothered by Isaac, the the brother, and he doesn't know why. So he uses uh, his hacking skills to get into Isaac's phone to see what's going on as at the same time that he's trying to figure out how to break uh, Vera, the scumbag drug dealer out. Uh, Prior to this, he tries to find out where Shayla is and, um, they refuse to tell him and basically tell him that he has to do what they say, stop asking too many questions, and things are going to go okay. So Elliot gets to work, and we cut back to Angela, and Angela is looking into Terry Colby, the man responsible for the cover-up for the toxic waste dump that got her mother killed, and also being the one who's been framed by F Society being responsible for the breach into Evil Corp's computers. So Angela is doing research onto the data dump, which revealed that Terry Kobe is responsible for the cover-up, as well as the original lawsuit that got dismissed um, because the plaintiffs in the case uh, couldn't prove that Evil Corp knew about the toxic waste. And Angela's calling all these lawyers, and nobody's calling her back, and then she's, she's at work doing all this research, and she's a little frustrated. Then we cut away to Darlene, and she's dropping these USB cord, uh, USB sticks outside of the detention cell and hoping to or somebody to pick it up and then go into the detention cell like a worker and plug it into some computer, which somebody does do. Uh, the individual does pick up, you know, a uh, law enforcement agent, a security guard picks it up, puts it into his uh, computer, and it looks like he's going to get some free music or free download and stuff. So he's really excited. But shortly after he um, does it, uh, whatever internal security breach software that was available detects that a virus is working and he immediately pulls the stick out and Elliot is on the other end and he's trying to, you know, access, he's responsible for the, the potential break-in, but it doesn't work because uh, the script or the virus that they were trying to use to uh, get into uh, the computer system, the prison computer system failed. And now Elliot is trying to figure out a way to another breach. And so he Guess gains permission to um, walk his dog because he has to walk his dog Flipper and the, the thugs do and they let him leave and do that and Ellie goes around the building and he starts yelling at Darlene wondering what the hell happened the breach didn't work and she's like there was no prep I had to do what I could I wrote you know what I can and she he accuses her of being a script kitty which we will get back to in a second when we talk about what's real and because her failure to execute a a good program he wasn't able to gain access and as he's trying to leave the second uh thug uh you know he tells darlene and elliot that they have to go back to the apartment she has to go with him elliot's saying that she's not involved he pulls up his gun and he you know shows that he he means business darlene you know was you know had an attitude prior to that that she's like you know we're basically just gonna have to tell him that's not possible to do this you know there you know if she had white papers to read if she had any research to be able to do any of this she would have been able to do and complete a script and she had no problem telling to these guys and i thought it was like okay tell us and so they go back to the apartment so Angela, we're going to cut away back to Angela. Angela is meeting with the only lawyer from the original case, the original lawsuit that would meet with her. 
And she's able to convince this lawyer to hear her out. And basically what Angela is saying is she went through the data date, the data dump and said there is information in there that there is a, a chance, a chance to go after Evil Corp and make them basically pay for what they have done. And the lawyer is saying, you know, you know, yeah, that may be true, but it's still Evil Corp. And Evil Corp is a very large conglomerate, is a very large organization with very powerful resources. And it's going to be very difficult, even if they have the truth on their side. And she explained that the last time as a lawyer that she initially took this case, that it took her years to gain her reputation back, to gain her reputation as a lawyer, to make a living again, because she, her and all the other lawyers from the case were just basically crushed so angela walks from this meeting and the lawyer is you know considering it she doesn't give affirmative to angela but she is she is she's gonna go through this and look at this and can really seriously considering they, they need an angle they need something solid they need a witness they need more than just his data dumps and so this gives angela some an idea and she goes to elliot well elliot is in the apartment with with um the the, the thugs and Darlene trying to figure out another solution to get into the jail cell. And she's, you know, buzzing the door, asking to be let in the building. And they basically tell him to get rid of her or they will. And so he goes down and Angela's just basically trying to get some input from Elliot about this a little, without directly telling him. And he's basically saying, you know, do what you need to do. You, you know, you can do this. You have the strength to do this. He, he he knows that this is not a good idea, but he needs to tell her what she needs to hear so she can leave. And he does. And that does give her an idea of what she needs to do next. And we'll get back to her in a little bit. So Elliot goes back up to the apartment and he's with Darlene and the, the thugs again. And he has to figure things out. Then we cut to Tyler Willick, and Tyler is meeting with the gentleman that he had the dinner with, the future CTO, and he's having a meeting, and they have a kind of a, a tense t t conversation, and Tyler, you know, is trying to needle this guy, you know, about the watch, about, you know, if he should be the next uh, CTO, and we'll talk about the watch because there's an interesting post um, about the watch and what that conversation really meant about the nature of watches. And the CT, this guy, he, he's having none of this. He sees through Tyler and he's just basically just crushes him in this, in this, um, conversation that how Tyler is just a, he's really nothing. He doesn't really mean anything. And in fact, um, he offers Tyler the watch. I mean, he doesn't even know how he got it. He doesn't remember how he even got this watch. And if Tyler really likes it so much, maybe he he should just have it. And uh, just insulting Tyler all, all along the way. And, and Tyler just really just cannot get the upper hand in this conversation. And so he walks away defeated and he, and he returns home to his wife. And there was a lot of like kind of a, a almost elitist conversations, like how Tyler's still in like this, you know, Soho apartment, two bedroom apartment, how he not really moved up, how he doesn't really have, you know, the panache or the status, even though he projects that he doesn't really truly have it. Unlike, unlike he, this guy does, unlike, you know, the CTO of this company does. And, Tyler just has a freak out and he just, you just can't figure out the exploit. He can't figure out how to break this guy. So he can either be the, the CTO of E Corp or at least his right hand man. So he can eventually be the CTO. And his wife says, you know, she's figured it out. She basically says that he has to go back to the wife because the wife, obviously clearly the exploit is she wants something. She, she has a need to be wanted. And so, there's that. And now we go back to Elliot and he has to, he is scrambling. He is spinning to figure out how to get into um, the jail cell. And what he does is he ha he has to actually physically go to the location. And what he does is he, he pays a visit to Veer. And they have a sit down and they have a conversation. And basically Elliot's saying that he, he doesn't want to ever see Veer again. Right? He's figuring this out. He's going to do this. But once it's done, he wants Veer out of his life. He wants Veer out of Shayla's life. He doesn't want to see Veer again. And Veer is, you know, he's impressed by Elliot. He admires Elliot in a way. And he 
he has no problem with that. He just doesn't understand why Elliot is there. And he basically says that he had to leave his phone behind and his phone is running a program to, sh- to find the Wi-Fi signal, to find an exploit that way to get into the network. So that way they can uh, leave a program that eventually will open the cell phone cell doors and get Vera out. And then once that happens, Vera has to, you know, basically run his way out of the, out of the jail. So they have this conversation. They make this agreement. Elliot is still kind of scrambling. He's uh, using his phone to figure out the Wi-Fi network to, to sniff out the Wi-Fi signal. He's able to do so by using a police cruiser. And then he's able to uh, use Darlene to get a little bit closer to be able to distract the uh, officer while he is going into the guy's computer and leaving the code that's necessary for him to break Vera out. And then he convinces um, Isaac, uh, Vera's brother, to let Darlene go, and they let Darlene go. So while they do that, while he's letting Darlene go, Isaac takes Elliot and they go for a drive. Uh, the other thug is like, you know, not very uh, happy about this because he's being left in the jail, near the jail prison with Darlene, a little bit exposed. And he takes Elliot to basically the, the harbor or some bay area of a city, an isolated place. And he takes a gun and he's going to kill Elliot. And Elliot kind of already knew this was somewhat kind of ha- happening, but he just didn't know, I guess, this soon. And he's trying to t- talk Isaac out of it. And he basically tells Isaac that if anything happens to him, that he gives him the same threat that he gave uh, Veer, that if anything happens to him, if he, if he dies, all the information, the business information, like the accounts and all that, that the police don't already have are not in the possession will be sent to them. He has a backup to where we're automatically sends in 24 hours. He will delete the entire business. All their accounts will be basically wiped out and there will be no money. And, this causes Isaac to pause, and he basically says, you know, hey, I can get Vera out. That's going to happen. There's no one doing that. But I can give you the business, and I can give you Veer, and what you do is of your own will. You know, you can do whatever you need to do. He only doesn't really care. He just wants Shayla and him to have no part of it. So Isaac agrees, with, agrees to this. He agrees that he's going to have control of the business, that Elliot's going to let that make that happen for him. And then I guess Isaac's just going to kill, kill Veer as soon as Veer is broken out of the prison. So that's the plan. That is the thing is that Elliot's going to break Veer out. He's going to get Shayla. And that's just going to be the end of all of this. So they go to the meet. It's like a couple minutes before Isaac's very nervous. Uh, the second thug is like asking, you know, Isaac, you know, why he has his piece out. And Isaac says that in case anybody rushes him because uh, Elliot's opening all the cell doors and letting everybody out. They're waiting for the program to launch. It gets to 950. The power goes out. I wonder why that is. He says that's what happens when all this, Elliot says that's what happens when all the cell doors open. Uh, the power comes back on. You can see a, a mass run of uh, prisoners running to the fence. They're breaking out. Here comes Vera walking very calmly to the party. He's very happy. He's very happy to see everybody. He's super excited. And then he tells the, the second thug, whose name is DJ, to shoot that cocksucker. And he ends up shooting his brother. And then he stares Elliot down. So, we get, so Vera gives Elliot this speech how he had to make a sacrifice to the universe because that's what it was called to him because he's his brother's keeper. And I came to Abel. He's going to be a fugitive on the world. And he wants Elliot to look, to look at Isaac and look at uh, what has happened. And, and that Elliot's proof that his business is over, that Elliot has no hold over him, that he can go ahead and burn everything to the ground and delete all the money it is no longer relevant because Isaac is dead Isaac was the business end of his business and that he has no problem being the brave warrior or the fugitive on the world a ghost and wandering the world as it be with no hold over him 
And so he, he's letting Elliot go and Elliot's asking for Shayla. And so he asks to keep the keys from DJ, the man who killed uh, his brother and hands it over to Elliot. And basically said, you know, she was with you the whole time, all along. And so Elliot goes and he, he opens the trunk and Shayla's in the trunk and he doesn't want to look, but he, he looks and it's obvious that uh, she's dead. Her her throat had been slit. And the entire time that he's been doing this for these guys, she has been in the back of the trunk, you know, dead. And so, you know, Elliot uh, closes the trunk and he puts his hood on and he, and he runs. Uh, he flees the scene. Um, Vera and DJ had already left in another car. And that's basically the, the end of the episode. Or the end of Elliot's story. Uh, prior to that, we saw Angela's part of the story where she went and visited and confronted uh, or tried to confront Terry Colby by knocking on his door. And really, it wasn't really more of like we thought it was going to be a confrontation. It was more like she was just verifying the type of... I guess uh, pol- he's on house arrest. The police device is on his an- uh, on his um, ankle. So really sh- not sure what her angle of the whole story is or what she's going to do. But it's obvious that she's going to try to go after Terry Colby in some way to make him to be a witness on a- the new case against Evil Corp. Uh, the other story that we didn't really mention was the fact that Mr. Robot paid a visit to Elliot, which brings the question of whether, you know, just after last night, last episode where it appears that Mr. Robot was interacting with people, whether or not Mr. Robot once again is real. And Elliot was kind of shocked because he was coming back from the conversation with getting rid of Angela that Mr. Robot was there. And he said that Darlene told him, uh, he, you know, what was going on. And, and that's why he was here and that he needed to forget about, you know, Mr. Robot was telling Elliot, you need to forget about Shayla. You need to forget about who she is, who she was. She's just a memory. You need to come on down and just leave. And he said, Darlene's up there. And Mr. Rowe as well, some sacrifices have to be made. And, you know, Elliot's not having any of this. And he's going to go up there and he's going to try to fix things. And Mr. Rowe saying that he can't fix things. He's he's not, that's not what he's supposed to do. That's not who he's supposed to be. He's going to mess up the overall plan. And Elliot just doesn't really care. He just wants to sa- save Shayla, uh, get Darlene out of there, and, and also save himself. So let's get into what's real. And then I have some concluding thoughts about this whole deal that went on with this episode. So what was real in the, ep- in the episode? Uh, there was a quite a number of hacks in this episode. One of them was the use of the Wi-Fi sniffer on Elliot's phone and also within his apartment. These these do exist. Uh, the These programs are out there. They exist for the sole purpose of obtaining information and taming people's uh, passcodes. Uh, in particular, finding out the exploits for a network. Uh, there's different types of uh, codes out there that do this for, for people. There's even apps. In fact, um, there was a story a few months back about in China they're actually selling an app through, I think it was the Android service or for Android phones where you can pay to gain uh, access to other people's Wi-Fi so you can have free Wi-Fi. Uh, so the use of the Wi-Fi sniffer on part of Elliot um, at the prison, it does exist. You can put it on an Android phone. You can also have it on your computer and use it as an exploit. Uh, the problem that he had with the gaining direct access to the, to the network, the use of uh, the WPAT, it is a very difficult network to, to break that type of Wi-Fi security. That's why a lot of people utilize it. Uh, that, that exploit is very difficult to do. That's why he eventually had to use a police cruiser because it had a weaker um, Wi-Fi exploit. And he was able to use that, that guy's computer, the, the police cruiser's computer, to gain access to the overall uh, computer network because... Everything is, is, you know, your strong is your weakest uh, link. In this case, with that, uh, the prison system, it was the police cruisers not having the same type of high-grade security that the uh, prison system themselves do. 
uh, when Elliot was having his conversation with Darlene when he was walking the dog and he accused her of being a script kitty. Uh, it, that's actually a, a derogatory term in the hacking world. Script kitties are just people that just download already pre-made um, exploits, viruses, malware, scripts. Uh, there's a whole entire marketplace for that. You can find that in the tour, even in the clear network, where basically you just... You download this, you upload the uh, download the pre-made uh, virus, and then you just upload it. You don't create it yourself. Uh, you don't tailor it to the program. Uh, this is why uh, the initial human exploit that uh, Darlene did with dropping the USB flash drives outside the uh, jail cell and hoping one of the, the employees will connect it to the computer s- system within, uh, it didn't work. While the human exploit worked, the the actual kitty program or the actual script program that she developed didn't work. Also, the fact that uh, when she was chewing out Elliot and even in Elliot's internal monologue about the, the amount of research is necessary to figure out the exploits for the prison system, they talked about white papers. And there is actually is a white paper out there. It's written by uh, uh, Newman Rad Starch. And he talks about the various exploits that can be utilized to gain access into um, the prison system. And so these white papers basically are these technical papers, these kind of academic-ish type of deals where people or hackers or academics think about what if scenarios or they postulate a certain theory or, for example, the Bitcoin white paper where they explain uh, the type of program they're developing in an easy, simplified manner that people can understand and view and verify for themselves. Oftentimes there's uh, math principles or math codes in there, even the actual code for a program sometimes is attached to the white paper. But mostly it's just about the nature of the, the program in itself. And people collect these white papers and they do this research. Uh, a lot of them are open source. A lot of them are behind paywalls or behind a uh, government research um, centers, kind of like LexisNexis or even deeper than that. They're just only shared within a certain circle of people, but they're just breakdowns of all the different exploits that can be out there for usage. And so this person, you know, this would be a type of person that, you know, Elliot or Darlene would download that paper, analyze it and figure out a way to gain access inside the prison. So I found this post on uh, Reddit in which it talked in depth about the the conversation that that Tyler had uh, with the future CTO uh, Scott about the watches and about what was really going on there. I mean, we saw some of what was going on with the fact that as Scott pressed saw through Tyler and wasn't pulling putting up with his bullshit and how he put him down with the fact that he's still living in some two bedroom apartment, you know, and not the best part of town, even though some people would consider Soho the best part of town. And also his aside of the fact that he had no idea how he got this watch or the fact that he was actually just going to give it away to Tyler since he liked it so much. So there's a bit of a, a bit of a, a thing to it. And, this cl- this individual uh, went by the Reddit user but of God. It's um, from the Reddit or Reddit subreddit um, Mr. Robot, and he, he basically talks about a, a watch collector's interpretation of the show. Uh, this is for my whole horrorific fanatics that watch this show. I have reason to believe that Sam Ismail is a watch collector after watching the latest episode and here's my interpretation of the show. First, you have to know about the holy trinity of watch brands. Viracone Constraint, VC, uh, Patek, Philip PP, and Amadeus Pidget. In the watch world, Vercona is considered the wise old grandfather. The Patek is a current king, and the AP is the up-and-coming prince. In the early episode of Mr. Robot, Tyler is seen wearing an Amadeus uh, Pidget Royal Oak, signifying he's the current prince and on the rise to take over. When Tyler goes to see Scott in the meeting room, he asks if he's wearing a Vercon constraint, implying that Scott's time is over and that there's a, that and that he's effectively a grandfather in the company. However, Scott replies by saying he's wearing a Patek Philippe, or in other words, stating that he's still the king. He then taunts Tyler by offering his Patek watch, which signifies him teasing Tyler with a CTO position to become the next king in the game. 
this infuriates Tyler. Obviously, this is just my interpretation. It's most likely that it all may just be coincidence. I don't think it's coincidence because nothing about within the show is coincidence. And um, in general, everything has a place and has a part. In particular, the fact we'll get into the kind of last speech that Vera had with Elliot. I, I think there's some 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 merit to this. Um, another impression note um, in the forum, Reddit Beauty EC, um, there are no extra here, but I do know that Tech Philip Turbo is very, very sought after watch. And if Tyler wanted to compliment Scott, he would said that's a beautiful Turbo. The fact that Scott couldn't even remember who gave him a hundred thousand dollar watch shows how rich he is. He is the one percent of the one percent, and Tyler, we know, isn't. There are very few people, people on the earth that can recall the giver of a gift like that. It shows that Scott is callous, rich, takes bribes, and manipulative, and knows a lot more than he lets on. Scott is evil corp. And then um, uh, the butt of gold goes on to talk a little bit more about the watches and the nature of watches. Uh, hey, thanks for reading. These are three companies that are known as the holy trinity of the Swiss watch world for several reasons, including their history, prestige, and the technical craftsmanship. They all had the Geneva seal, which is highly covered in the Swiss, Swiss watch area. To get this seal, you have to meet a very particular set of requirements. As I mentioned above, Bacron is the oldest of the bunch, being founded in 1755, along with, I believe, Bergart. Bacron is one of the oldest watches companies in existence today, being worn by the likes of Napoleon and Queen Elizabeth. Patek Philippe is currently the most valued of the bunch today. It's the second oldest of the three. Founded in 1852, AP is a brand that is the youngest out of the three and is on the rise. These three companies have comp complications in their timepieces. They're very meticulous and delicate. Outside of the Holy Trinity, there are very well-respected brands such as the German company A. Lang Sondron, Forget, and Gyagar Lacardi. But the Holy Trinity are the upper echelon of the watchmaking world. So that speaks volumes upon that. Uh, the, when the so it speaks to kind of like the added layer that this show has um, within it. In particular, with the speech that uh, Veer had uh, towards Elliot talking about Cain and Abel. Uh, Cain and Abel is actually a, a uh, password recovery tool for Microsoft operating systems. Um, so I don't think it was... Um, just not going just for the obvious about the fact that they were brothers and what he did was slaying his brother, but also kind of a ton in cheek way of, of talking about computers and the whole hacking space. Because what just happened there was that um, with Elliot breaking him out, Veer by killing Isaac, not only just, you know, not only just killed his brother, but he also just recovered in a sense, his sense of purpose, his sense of well being through the use of Elliot. This by, by doing this, he no longer, he's no longer a master or a slave to anybody or anything. He's a free person. He's able to recover what he needs to do. So those are the things um, that I noticed that were real. Again, Elliot still loses, uses Lex, Lexic Nix as his uh, go-to operating system for everything, both for his laptop. Um, even his phone has a, a particular type of Lexus I uh, program on his android and the uh, his home setup to do all the hacking that he does so what does this mean like in conclusion with this episode um i think this is going to have significant consequences more so than elliot's breakdown that he had with his withdrawals from the morphine um because, again, this speaks to the core ethos of Elliot. He thinks that he is a savior of the world, and he couldn't save Shayla. Shayla died because of his actions, because he decided he was going to save her from Vera and tip off the law enforcement. He placed you know, Shayla not only in danger, but she died because of that, because he thought that he could hack his way into saving her, that he could, in essence, put a drug dealer away and there were, was not going to be any consequences. Um, the other thing here is the finding out that maybe Angela, you know, has a bit of a set of teeth of her own. Uh, she may not be uh, of the same 
intellectual thinker or strategist that Elliot is, but she's quite capable of coming up with her own kind of plan, whatever that may be, and executing it. Um, she already did so with putting the exploit, the uh, malware, or whatever it is on that disc uh, in her boyfriend's name or ex-boyfriend's name, I should say. Figuring out the data dump and also trying to convince that lawyer to actually look at the case and revisit it and possibly getting to somehow figuring out how to get uh, Tyler Kobe as a witness to this case against Evil Corp. So that's that's this episode. I mean, that a lot happened. You know, Shayla died. Uh, Vera is out in the world doing who knows what. Uh you know, we're still not sure about Mr. Robot. Uh, Darlene is showing. I really want to see Darlene's background because she had a set of teeth on her or, or a set of balls on her, how she had no problem confronting these guys, particularly after um, what happened with the Dark Army and her participation to get them involved. I, I think there's something within her background that just makes her think or makes her believe maybe it might be a, na- a naive thing to believe that she can just basically take on the world with no issues and no problems. So that's it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed the review. This has been a Herosha Shine Space Odyssey Network production.